Hi, I'm Peter Erskine, and you are watching In the Pocket with the Brothers. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you like that? Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for coming, for being here. It's a great honor. You were born in New Jersey, right? And you started Correct. playing drums at the age of four. Yes, I uh, I just posted uh, on Facebook. This seems to be where I, I spend most of my uh, uh, online time. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. But uh, I posted a recording uh, that I remembered having but needed some... Uh, some cleaning up in terms of the audio. So I, I sent it to uh, my engineer and he took out hums and different noises. And, and it's a recording of myself uh, at four years of age. Uh, the drumming's not very good. I mean, I'm just playing along with, uh, uh, with a recording uh, that my father had. And, and just by chance, I found the actual uh, album. Uh, I, I didn't remember the name. Uh, and all of a sudden, I came across it, and, and there was the album cover uh, with this, uh, the, the photos of the sexy woman dancing. And I, I remembered having a boy crush on her uh, at four years of age. And, and, and anyway, this, this tape recording was made with a small portable reel-to-reel -reel machine. And I'm playing along on a little tom-tom mm. uh, with the song. And, and my sister, who was... Uh, I think operating the tape recorder was was uh, uh, my older sister was helping, uh, and and then she uh, she wanted me to do something for the recording, and you can hear her voice suggesting how I should play it, and um, and uh, you hear my four year old voice say I, I say stop it, I'll play it any way I want to, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, we have an expression in English that the that the acorn uh, grows into uh, you know becomes the oak tree, um, and I used to like that. And, <laughs> yeah, like you're saying, so you still I'm, like that. I'm still like yeah, uh, I'm still <laughs> like that. And in, in fact, I, I did a recording uh, during the lockdown. Well, I, I did I did one tune for this gentleman, and, and he was very grateful, and he liked the drum track, and so he sent me another one. And I'm working on it with the engineer. I've set aside the, the evening and we're wearing our masks. You know, we're being very careful. Yeah. And I was quite excited by the way this, this drum track was coming out. And um, uh, I sent it to him. And, and uh, the way it normally works, I, after I'm happy uh, that I've got a good take, I send it to the client. And uh, I take their notes and I'll, I'll do it one more time. Um, it's not an endless process of, uh, you know, I'll punch in and, and change one little thing. Yeah. It's, you know, I'm giving them a performance of me. And I want to make sure they're happy. But uh, in any event, uh, I, I, I do the, you do, the second. You do one take. Is that it? Is that what you're saying? Well, I do, I do, I do one take and I send it. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I receive their notes and then I give them another take. So uh, I said, okay, f fair enough. And I, I do the next take and it's, wow, this is really great. And the guys, uh, well, you played a, uh, there's a tom-tom fill there I don't like or something. Yeah. And, and I'm usually very specific. I play things for a reason. Yeah. And in any event, uh, I said, you know what? This was a mistake. You don't need to pay me, but you don't get my drum track. You can't have it. <laughs> so. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, but you have so, the... You know, it makes so now I have this great. I have a great drum track to a to a. Uh, now I have to invent a song to go with it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I, uh, I was like, no, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not a drum machine. I mean, know? it's funny because you started talking about that because I wanted to kind of eventually come up to this um, topic about how you record oh, your drums. You know, now is a good time. Yeah, I mean, it's like I know nowadays with all the computers. Oh, there you go. Wow, this is how I record my drums. And um, this uh, this camera setup, I I uh, agree, is somewhat impressive. It's amazing. Uh, that's a, that's a true overhead there. Um, I even have a I have a, a snare drum special. I even have a a, a bass drum cam. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's amazing. I have a couple. I have uh, two or three different drum sets. I will. Uh, I will use. I also. Uh, I have a secret weapon. Um, I don't mind to show you. Uh, uh, it's this old. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Rogers drum set uh, that I found online, um, and it had never been played. It sat in the basement of a music store since 1965. Okay. I mean, uh, originally it was in a in, in a store window, I guess. No one had purchased it, um, and uh, Steve Maxwell, who. Uh, uh, has a couple of uh, wonderful drum shops, uh, and you can you can see his drums online. He he does these uh, really excellent uh, pr- demonstrations or presentations on on a drum set that that he's offering for sale. And this one, he said, I, it's never been played. He said, I'm not going to play it. I'm just going to show it to you. So I jumped on that, uh, and it's been a real joy. Uh, you know, and why do we like old drum sets? Uh, Sure, there's, there's, there's a bit of romance. Um, we all like to look back. There you go. What's that? It's a Ludwig. It's the model um, that uh, Ringo played with. There you go. <laughs> so we enjoy the romance, but also uh, the wood is old. Of course, it's aged for, for 50 years or more. Uh, but also these were old growth trees that the wood was harvested from. So it's a, it's a, it was a different nature, literally yeah, yeah. a different quality of wood, uh, than, than newer drums. Um, so drum making technology, I think has, has, has become incredible. Now that they're talking about this, how do you tune your drums? Is it with a tuner or do you do it old school? Like you would have to do it back in when you, you know, started off. I use both. Uh, because my hearing is not so good, uh, and I have uh, I have difficulty hearing the overtones, so uh, a tuner uh, helps confirm where I'm at. I mean, most of the time I do it just kind of by touch and and, and tapping around the the, uh, the tuning lug points yeah, yeah. while pressing down on the head a bit. My colleague professor at the University of Southern California, uh, Aron Serfati, originally from Caracas, Venezuela, mm-hmm. uh, he's my secret weapon. Uh, oh, yeah. He'll often come over. And he'll tune my drums for me. Cool, man. Um, and the, uh, of course, the latest drum that we're that we're tuning is is this okay. guy. This is my new wow signature amazing. snare drum. Uh, it's just being introduced uh, now by Tama. It's uh, four and a half uh, by fourteen inches. The shell is made of of spruce and maple. Mm-hmm. Stick saver uh, hoops, uh, eight lugs. A reinforcing ring around the, uh, the the top of the shell, but not the bottom, um, and it's just a remarkable drum. And we're calling it the jazz snare drum. We think it it makes a perfect addition to uh, every drummer's snare drum collection. And we all, you know, have a lot of snare drums. That, that yeah, seems yeah. to be <laughs> one one thing the drummers have in common. Um, and, and the incredible thing was the price. We worked very hard to make it as uh, uh, affordable as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cool. um, when, when I tune when I tune my drums, uh, basically I follow the the old Louis Belson uh, dictum, which was uh, think of the drum set as a choir. Okay. You have your sopranos, altos, the tenors, the baritone, and, and bass. So high to low, and I don't tune to a specific pitch. Uh, but somehow my drums generally seem to always come out uh, tuned to approximately the same pitches. Uh, so there are there are certain notes that seem to work with. You know, in the beginning of your career, did you? I don't feel you went as much for that muffled sound as a lot of drummers went. Is that accurate or not really? You know, like a lot of uh, they would cut out a lot of harmonics in the 70s and early 80s. That was that was primarily because I just didn't really know that much about the recording process. I mm. remember one of the first times in the studio, I was on tour with Maynard Ferguson and and w- the, 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 the traveling band got one day in the studio and then they were turning it over to the recording professional. So Harvey Mason had been flown in to New York, uh, but he's kind of standing around though, while they let us embarrass ourselves in the studio. I, you know, I didn't <laughs> work with a click track. 
Um, and my drums were, were wide open sounding, but there, there were also the rental drums that he was going to use. Yeah. Um, and so I asked him, well, Harvey, you know, how, how do you tune your drums for the studio? And he, he tapped on all the toms. And then when he got to the rental tom, and it was, had tape on it, and it, it sounded like a, like the box it came in. I mean, it's a yeah, yeah. And, and he hit it, and he looked at me. He said, he said this drum's going to record the best. And that was the that was the sound aesthetic of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so my drums would ring too much, and and with the close mic placement, then it was getting too much of the ring. It's not as I, a critique, getting, man. I'm just saying, it like it, you would stand out. You know what I mean? Because you had your own sound. No, I, it, it was just uh, you know I didn't know what I was doing, but but uh, two days ago, uh, my engineer came over and um, I I changed. Uh, this setup because uh, I'm going to be working soon with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and we're going to do the symphonic dances from West Side Story. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll set up this. It requires four tom-toms. That's when I have the wood block and a cowbell and, and this stuff. Um, but you'll notice I don't have mics on the tom-toms. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's because uh, I, I like the sound just of the overhead. Well, uh, yeah, I said it just sense. sounds more natural and 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 I can take care of the balance now because my floor tom is 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 a little far away um, uh, from the overhead. So you can't oh, I don't know if you can see it here. No, I'll have to I'll go to my handheld. Um, I, I do have a, a microphone on that. That's a, a yeah, yeah. sure clip ons. Um, and uh, I used to use uh, Shure overheads. Right now I'm using, uh, I have these Sony overheads that I really like. Uh, on that kit over there, I have some vintage Sony mics. Oh, yeah, uh, wonderful. I have a DPA on the snare, uh, an SM7 for the bass drum, mm -hmm. and that's Shure mic for the, uh, for the hi-hat. Yeah, and, and normally I would just use a, a, a 57 on the snare. Um, but but this DPA microphone is 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 very nice. I mean, all those sensitive. like great recordings from even the swing era and uh, even up to Motown. I mean, the Motown that those sixties and seventies stuff. It's like I think the drums were like one or two mics. Just, that doesn't yeah, stop mics. it from grooving and sounding great, right? No, there was just you know one one overhead and and then one mic on the bass drum, and then eventually they started doing stereo, uh, but. Uh, yeah, we all love that sound, and um, it's it's just honest and mm -hmm. sounds good. Now, the other day I did a recording, uh, supposedly for some vintage uh, type sounds. Uh, this was for the director of uh, the same director that that did Whiplash and La La Land, Damien Chazelle, and his composer Justin Hurwitz. Uh, and I was at Capitol Studios. Wow. Um, and they had multiple uh, microphones on. I had a 24-inch bass drum, and and I think there were six. No, there were five. Excuse me, five RCA ribbon microphones uh, positioned around the room. Was this after Al Schmidt I, passed away? Yes, yes, this was after Al had passed away. Unfortunately, it was my first time back in Capitol uh, since Al had passed. They got a remarkable sound, and 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 I had all of Studio B which is the smaller of the two large live rooms there at Capitol Studios. Uh, I had all Studio B to myself. Cool, man. Um, and it was a heck of a sound. Uh, Al Schmidt was wonderful. And, and, and uh, you know, Al, in the old days, yeah, he it was all, even even with all the multi-track technology and, and various microphones, uh, it was all in the mic placement. When you would look at, look at the mixing board, all his level, you know, he wasn't having to do mm -hmm. a lot of this. Uh, he was just very careful about mic placement. So for the drummers out there, um, you know, pay attention to uh, to mic placement. And if you get a uh, if you get a drum sound in the studio you like, uh, make a note of, of of which mics and and how they were positioned, and also the sound of the room that you were in. Um, and uh, you know, one thing I learned uh, was if if an engineer would make a request that your drum is ringing too much. If I noticed that the microphone was too close to the to the head, particularly at the edge, I, I would I'd say uh, you know, before we 
before we change the sound of the drum, can we can we experiment with the placement of the microphone? Yeah. Um, at the same time, I always offer to any engineer, live or studio, um, I say, you know, let me know if 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 the drum sound is misbehaving mm -hmm. for you. Uh, if uh, so, that that shows my willingness to 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 work with them. Um, and establishes we, we we can have a dialogue the the message underneath that is uh of course i'm the drummer you're the engineer um yeah and you know so so we 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 each uh, are very comfortable to do our job now are you are you uh, i see that mixing board there uh yeah, this are you is an a engineer and a drummer from yet. no uh, no we kind of uh we're all singers, producers. We produce our own stuff. So we write and we play. Nah, nah, nah. Me and my brothers, we're three brothers. I play okay. drums. Uh, that, this drum kit was my dad's. So he bought it in the US in the 60s. Wow. That's he brought fantastic. it over. Fantastic. So yeah, we have we love, have love for everything that's, you know, vintage, uh, old school music. And where are you in Portugal? Well, it's it's the capital, Lisbon. You've been You're here, right? Lisbon, okay. You've been here? Yeah, I've been to Lisbon. Yeah, yeah, I've been, yeah. I've, I spent a fair amount of time in Porto. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a, a contemporary uh, classical uh, ensemble mm -hmm. based there. They, they uh, a beautiful concert hall. It's a new. Well, it was a new concert hall at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I remember. Casa de Musica. Uh, the, that's what they call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Casa de Musica. Uh, the people were were wonderful, and so was the food. Yeah, the food, the fado, and, and, and the <laughs> need to come back, man. I would love to, uh, and 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 I hope to one day soon. I wanted to kind of just go back. I mean, a lot of people heard of you, obviously, but I just like to kind of recap your, you know, your career. Going back, you started at age four. I know your dad got, played some bass, right? He was a bass player. Uh, by the time I was born, uh, he was practicing psychiatry. He's yeah. a medical doctor. Uh, but I was the one of the four children who uh, shared his uh, love of, of music, particularly jazz music. And so he was my best friend uh, growing up, and both my parents gave me tremendous support. I, I got uh, drum lessons. I went to summer music camps. These summer and, music camps, uh, um, I mean, that must have been so important. I mean, how, how many years in a row did you go to these summer camps? I, I went to my first camp when I was uh, seven years old. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a couple photos. That I think you and the viewers will enjoy these. So, um, uh, this was my my first uh, uh, my first summer jazz camp. There I am with uh, Louis Hayes. Yep. And uh, and here I am a year later playing with Donald Byrd. Wow. Um, so. Uh, yeah, you know, I was very fortunate. There I am with uh, Oliver, the great Nelson, Oliver yeah. Nelson. Yeah, I was going to ask you about him. Yeah, actually. So, uh, you know, this this has been a a year of of of, of many challenges uh, uh, for the entire world and and uh, in America certainly. You know, we've gotten out of this uh, the political nightmare, but we're not completely out of the woods with that. Um, and and it's it's been a year of reckoning. Yeah. Um, and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, touched all of us, and 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 I, uh, I was grateful to to have the opportunity to look back on my life and to realize that the language I speak is is is, is black music language. It's it's thanks to the black men and women who created this music, and and I am a product or a child of uh, white privilege, and. Um, you know that uh, I was born into that. My 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 parents were very supportive, uh, but you know I enjoyed things that a lot of other people might not have. The uh, the only thing that played in my favor, uh, uh, as I wrote, um, you know, I was born with a cheerful heart, um, and uh, and I was able and quite happy to show my love to these men for their music, and and. Uh, and it's it's a it's part of the jazz tradition to pay it forward, and they were all, almost to a person, very generous, with uh, with teaching, with sharing their music, 
Uh, and so um, I just I followed the music. I yeah, loved yeah. playing. Uh, I was always curious. Um, my interest wasn't limited just to jazz. I also loved classical music. I, I ended up going to classical summer camps, which led me to uh, uh, high school. Uh, in a place called Interlock in Michigan. Uh, it's a world-famous music camp, but it was mm -hmm. also uh, a, a winter high school where... Uh, so I left home when, when, when I was 14. And uh, my new family were all these other kids who were artists, mostly musicians. And then um, after one year of college, I went on the road. I was 18 years old. I joined the Stan Kenton Band. Yep. And did a lot of growing up you know, on stages and, and eventually in, in recording studios. Um, so everyone has their unique story. Everyone has a path. Um, and uh, my path uh, uh, in, in terms of drum technique focused more on, on tone. Mm -hmm. it, it took me years to find a sound and a touch that I liked. Um, uh, less on technique. Um, I'm one of the few drummers I know that never uh, owned a copy of Stick Control when, when, okay. when he was learning how to play. It was just odd, you know, what the, the, the methods that my teacher employed. Um, but they, they worked for me. And um, I'm grateful now to not only uh, be able to look back on a, on a, a life of music, but that I can... Uh, I can teach, you know, I'm, I'm here at the University of Southern California. Not here, I mean, now I'm here in my home studio. This has been my university teaching place because we've been online for the past year. So you live in, in LA or around there? I live in Santa Monica. California is huge, you know what I mean? I have my LA Dodgers LA baseball does. cap. I'm going to go see them play in a couple of days. Oh, that would be nice. Get out. Yeah, yeah, my uh, my children are taking me. That's their uh, their birthday gift. I just had my 67th birthday. Oh, happy birthday. So, you know, I've been I've been playing the drums uh, for over 60 years. My relationship to the instrument is finally maybe changing after all this time. Uh, the 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 year of a very limited playing opportunities and performances uh, has allowed me to uh, develop my interest in, in some other things. Um, I'll always be a drummer and always think of myself that way, but uh, you know. So, uh, so what are you up to then? What are you, are you well, into new, new, new stuff? I want to do uh, more composing. Um, uh, the teaching okay. thing became became more kind of codified and important to me, uh, and also uh, photography and writing. So a, a lot of what I'm interested in, I think, has to do with, with legacy. I, I think I was intuitively preparing for something uh, before my heart attack. Uh, uh, I was kind of frantically trying to assemble all the writings, all the photos. And, uh, it was about two and a half months ago, I, I had this heart attack, uh, feeling better than ever now. Um, and, uh, you know, between that and, and, and this common thing that we've all shared in, in terms of not being able to leave our homes for over a year, yeah. um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's only natural that uh, your relationship to a lot of things will change. Where you where you give lessons? What what are what are the courses you teach? I'm the director of drum set study, so okay. um, I have uh, usually uh, uh, 12 uh, students each semester who take one hour private lessons every week. It's 14 weeks a semester. It's 28 lessons times 12. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of lessons, um, and I also uh, run the uh, Introduction to drumming courses that uh, are very popular with, with uh, non-drummers as well as non-musicians. So we we found that our jazz and pop students, you know, horn players, singers, rhythm section musicians, composers, songwriters, whatever, uh, they became better, especially within a band, even if it wasn't a jazz band, uh, once they studied drums. Uh, they became more aware of the spaces between notes and understanding of rhythm and the evolution of, of jazz and pop music, which is, mm -hmm. uh, again, black music in America, mm -hmm. and the role of the drums. So uh, most conservatories have uh, piano proficiency requirements. Uh, 
uh, now USC has uh, drum set proficiency requirements. So coming up with a curriculum for that has been fun. And and this this fancy camera setup I was showing off. Yeah, so what, I, I'm I'm envious. <laughs> I need to well, sort myself it, out. It, 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 it took a lot of work. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've got I've got video switchers and I have multiple uh, monitors and and two different computers, uh, uh, the foot switches. I mean, all, all sorts of stuff to make this work. But then we discovered, well, OK, so now the teacher has a great setup, but the students are still you know, yeah. suffering with bad Wi-Fi uh, or they don't have enough equipment. So the school uh, was very proactive in supplying interfaces and wow. audio and, and video devices. Uh, but but still, they had they had bad Internet. So we created um, I had an idea and 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 our dean of the music school supported this. The dean is like the, yeah, yeah, the, the head, head of the school head yeah, person. Yeah. And we refer to these as lesson pods. So if I'm not able to be in the same room with a student, the student can go into one of these lesson pods. Where there are four cameras. There's a video switcher, completely mic drum set, uh, large screen monitor, direct wired uh, University of Southern California, powerful internet. Um, and, you know, I mean, look, look at this. If, if, if I'm... If I'm showing a student brush technique, wow, you know I can I can show them brush technique. It's almost better on camera than in life. Exactly, <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, here I normally I have a uh, on the other drum set I have a camera holder, but uh, I'll just I'll just show you with this, you know. Now no student is gonna you know come right up to the snare drum like this camera can. Yeah, exactly. Or actually, this is a better point of view. And they can see, you know, the relationship of uh, you know, my arms, my elbows to my body. Am, am I playing like this? Am I playing like this? Relax. Now, visually, you're not quite seeing the snare drum now because I got all that stuff in the way, but um, it's wonderful. You get the idea, and uh, it's been kind of fun, you know. So um, uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to give me some lessons. You might sure. be expensive, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> might become a good, good <laughs> idea. It's <laughs> so, wow, man. So how long did you take you to put that those those uh, cameras um, up? This uh, basically, uh, I mean, I was you, know, I was already doing some video teaching for artistworks.com, and. Uh, that was a few years ago. We, we yeah, recorded sure. up in their studio over 200 lessons. And I had a two camera setup. So basically I, I, had, I had that camera and I had an overhead. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. Uh, and these were connected by means of analog. So the, the, the RCA, you know, red, blue, green cables. And I wanted to switch to digital, but uh, the only digital multiple camera device I was finding at the time, you know, HDMI cable compatible, mm -hmm. uh, was made by the Roland Corporation of, of all companies. Uh, and Dave Weckl was using that. Um, but uh, it was pricey. All of a sudden, uh, Blackmagic Design, I had some experience with, with some of their products, came out with this thing called the ATEM. And uh, that is this okay all right so i got one of those and i got a second one and i piggybacked them they now also offer an a channel version um so like a video controller right so you can it's a video controller yeah. so the things we discovered um certain cables uh, can't be over a certain length um that that's why we got two computers so one handles uh, all the video and online connecting the other does Strictly audio. I call it like my Pro Tools computer, even though I'm okay. using uh, software called Luna. Uh, that's uh, that's made by Universal Audio because I have those interfaces. So uh, then the beauty in the ATEM software is I can offset video and audio by a few frames to get the synchronization mm -hmm. just right. Um, 
And uh, then for the talking head mic, uh, I've, I've, uh, I have an inline preamp, so when I hit the foot switch, it doesn't create a pop every time. Um, and it was just things by trial and error. My engineer, uh, his name is Aaron, was so, so knowledgeable and so helpful. And uh, we spent a lot of hours uh, a year ago. That's how we spent the summer, converting from, from a one or two camera setup to because, you know, Rico, my, my position was uh, the University of Southern California is four miles from Hollywood. And if we can't come up with a, with a spectacular yeah, yeah, video yeah, yeah, presentation yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for teaching. Makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want Ohio State uh, or North Texas to beat us at, at what should be our own game. So I, yeah, I think yeah. we're doing okay. Fantastic. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. My name is Danny Alex. I want to remind you, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. So on YouTube, we've got the Brothers Gram, which is our name for this channel. And then we have Indie Pop Records, where we put some other stuff as well. We also share these videos as well. Instagram, which is also the Brothers Gram. So it's all written below. Can't go wrong. Not difficult. Just follow us, like us, subscribe to us, comment, let us know what you think. Stay safe. Peace. I would like to talk about, if possible, Obviously, he deserves to be mentioned, you know, Jack or Pistorius. If you could mm -hmm. probably talk a bit about him, probably more of the personal side of how he was with you and your relationship with him. It seems like you guys were pretty close, you know? Yeah, we were. There's a photo of us. Another photo. That's from the from Joni Mitchell, Mitchell yeah. Mingus yeah. session. Um, I won't bore you with that. I got a few photos here, but... Uh, you know, Jocko uh, gave me my big break. He 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 heard me playing in a big band and recommended me to Weather Report. I mean, it was kind of an unlikely uh, choice, uh, but they took a chance based on his recommendation. And he he liked something that he heard in my beat, um, and uh, we we hit it off. I mean, we 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 became you know instant friends. And um, I, I think we were quite close. Uh, we we were very comfortable around one another. We 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 grew up listening to a lot of the same music. Uh, he and I were half the age of Joe and Wayne, and I was certainly grateful for him, you know, getting me out of that that, that big band universe and in, 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 uh, into Weather Report, which which led to a, a lot of other things. Um, so uh, he, he was a very funny guy, um, remarkable musician. Um, you know, you have to, you have to kind of look back at the time uh, in, in the late 70s. Uh, I mean, drugs and, and alcohol uh, have long been a problem. Um, they, they seem like, uh, like they're fun and, and then they become uh, medicine or a solution for people and and then they, they uh, addiction becomes the mm -hmm. uh, reveals itself to be the disease that it is and so Jocko was beset with uh, with these problems uh, due to addiction and 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 some uh, underlying I think psychological issues that weren't helped and uh, unfortunately uh, when when a lot of us were in the middle of all that we were all just enjoying being in the party you know that that's that's what it was like back in those days there's a, a very strong sense of loss and um uh, i was in italy i talk about this in the jocko jocko documentary and shortly after he had died a, a fan came up you know, saying hello to fans after the concert and he was uh, he was sincerely distraught and he he said how could you all have let this happen and I, you know i didn't have an answer because I, uh, I, I didn't know uh, why we weren't smart or why we, uh, and, and you know, and, and everyone at New Jocko tried to help. My father tried to help. My dad was a, was a, 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 a very formidable presence and, yeah. and a psychiatrist. And, and my dad said, you know, Jocko is just, he's, he's not an easy patient. You know, yeah. He's just, he's, he doesn't want to get well. Mm -hmm. Um, so exacerbated again by uh, um, people are funny. Uh, 
they they uh, they enjoy uh, characters in their lives having bad boys uh, in their lives, and then they feel they uh, cheated or robbed if the bad boy's not, the bad not boy misbehaving boy. enough. Yeah, you yeah. know, John Belushi was the same thing. So so uh, people would function as enablers to get there. Oh, good. Now we got to see uh, we got to see that person uh, get get really drunk or messed up. Now I can go home and, and, and go to bed. And then that person's left there. I saw that happen with the band leader, Stan Kenton. There oh, were okay. guys in the band that loved to you know, get drunk with him. And when drinking was, was the last thing he should have been doing you know, in, in terms of his health. Uh, and then they'd all, they'd all go back to their hotel rooms. And, and then there he was stumbling around the, the, the hallways of, of a hotel, unable to... Mm-hmm. Put the key in the, uh, yeah, the yeah. To let himself into his room, you know, that kind of stuff. You were young. You were young then. You were 18, right? When you joined Stan Kenton. So yeah, yeah. And I remember the first, yeah. the first time I saw him drunk. I didn't know what to do. I, I you know, I'd never seen anyone drunk <laughs> yeah, like that. You know, I mean, it was it was a whole other level of uh, inebriation. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so uh, you know. And that that's uh, we're not here to talk about yeah yeah that so much it but but it, but that that is that is part of the of the story of Jocko unfortunately and that's mm-hmm. why we lost him the documentary if people are curious the yeah. the, the Jocko documentary um, is very well done uh, it is and uh, Robert Trujillo from Metallica of all places um, is the guiding light and the the gentleman who produced that film made it possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very well. It's very you know, well. I uh, I saw a, there, there was a, a film. There was, there was a film that, that that Metallica starred in. It was about the band, and my wife and I watched it on video. And in the film, Robert Trujillo uh, is, is auditioning. It's an incredible performance. Uh, but you know, I didn't follow the band. And uh, anyway, uh, a few months later. Uh, I'm in a uh, Frankfurt airport waiting to board the plane to fly home. And, and on the other end of the uh, the boarding area, I see this guy and I, I said to myself, but that looks like that. Uh, that looks like that guy from that Metallica. Metallica movie. Now, nah, what would he be doing here? Then I see him with a with a with a leather guitar case. Or, or bass, electric bass case. Said, That's got to be him. So I time it. Uh, so we walked down the, the jetway at the same time, and I said, excuse me. I said, I really enjoyed the, the, that movie you were in. He goes, oh, thanks. I said, yeah, I'm a musician, so uh, I appreciate it. And he goes, looks at me and goes, are you like in a band or something? <laughs> and I said, well, when I was younger, I used to play in a group called Weather Report. And he stops, and he goes, holy shit, dude. I was at your 1978 Santa Monica Civic show with Jocko. I said, you're kidding. He goes, no, no. Hey, Robert, I'm Peter. So anyway, uh, it turned out just by chance we were seated across the aisle from each other. Okay. So we were the two annoying passengers <laughs> on the airplane who talked across the aisle the entire flight. <laughs> that's but, that's uh, yeah, then then uh, he invited me to, to speak and become part of it. I, in fact, I might even have already done some of the interview. He just came in and 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 got that thing completed yeah, yeah. and done. It. Yeah. What about uh, Michael Brecker? When you joined Steps Ahead, right? How was that? Well, Michael was uh, he was a hero of mine. I mean, the first time I got to play with him, he was overdubbing on a, on a track I had done on a on a Michelle. Uh, Columbia album um, and uh, I just remember telling all my friends I can't believe it I'm on I'm on the same tune with Michael Brecker even though I'm, here I am already playing with Wayne yeah yeah um, uh, Michael and Randy were, were, were so great and uh, when I finally got to know Michael and then we were both in in, in, in the band I mean that, that was he was really the reason he and Don Grolnick and Mike Minieri and, and Eddie Gomez who was in the band they they were the reason that I moved to New York. I left Los Angeles because they said, do you want to play with the band? And, and, and Steps was, was kind of a, a casually thrown together group. 
uh, that made a recording for Japan, and Steve Gadd was the first drummer. Then Steve uh, left the band, and uh, so just as luck would have it, I was doing some work with, with some of them, and, and then Don Grolnick brought me into that band. He, he recommended they, they give me a, a, a shot. So I left Los Angeles and moved to New York, and that really began a whole other phase of my career. And Michael uh, was such an a incredible playing partner on the stage, but also a, a tremendous mentor. And, um, you know, we were talking about sobriety. Michael uh, became sober and helped more people than I can count mm. um, as a sponsor. And uh, uh, so I still, myself, I'll, I'll have the occasional beer or glass of wine yeah, yeah. Um, or glass of port. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Michael uh, uh, was, uh, was such an incredible human being in addition to being such a powerful yeah, yeah. musician. Um, if I can recommend uh, a, a track, the Steps Ahead album, Modern Times, is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we did a really good job on that record. But Michael also played on a, on a tune of mine called, well, an album of mine called um, Motion Poet. The song is actually uh, composed by Vince Mendoza. And it's okay. called Hero with a Thousand Faces. And it's just one of the most incredible saxophone solos I've ever heard. Last time I got to play with him uh, was on the Some Skunk Funk album, and that was with the WDR Big Band. Uh, you can find that on YouTube, uh, Some Skunk Funk, WDR Big Band. And yeah. it's pretty great. Willie's playing bass, I'm on drums. Marcio Doctor uh, is, uh, is, is playing, he's from Argentina, he's playing percussion. Mike and Randy Brecker, the incredible radio big band from Cologne, Germany, and uh, Vince Mendoza. Wow. So it's a lot of circles. We all keep, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we, back in those days, were you living in Los Angeles or were we living in New York? Well, I, I started, uh, you know, I, I did a, a, a one or two projects with Michael, and then um, uh, I moved to New York, uh, primarily because Michael and Don Grolnick and Mike Minieri were all living in New York at the time. So I left Weather Report to join Steps, which became known as Steps Ahead. It was a, probably a less stressful um, uh, uh, band from what I hear from you, <laughs> from your yeah, story. Well, I, felt, I, I felt a sense of relief and, and you know, uh, they were willing to, to play a tune that I wrote. Yeah, and and I couldn't get my foot in that door with Weather Report. Mm -hmm. the Weather Report was a very, uh, uh, old school kind of machismo you know macho band and i learned a lot from it but i you know i wasn't quite uh different frequencies right yeah different frequencies that's that's well put yeah yeah i actually met my wife uh on my first tour of japan with okay. weather report okay i'm gonna go to the audio uh audio visual thing one more <laughs> time here just to show you because it's it's pretty pretty fantastic so um, here's my wife. The first time I met her, she was the interpreter on a weather report. Tour. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. That's funny. And, uh, and then I fell in love with her, um, uh, when steps, uh, played in, in Japan, um, uh, in, uh, just seven years later. Um, and this was, uh, this was the Steps band at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Victor Bailey, right? And Victor Bailey, the wonderful Victor Bailey. Uh, uh, wait, my, my favorite, let me see, my favorite picture of my wife. Here's my favorite picture, ready? <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Playing my drum. Yeah. So uh, we have two, we have, we have two children. Um, our son, Tai Chi, is a video editor. Our daughter, Maya, uh, is a star of a television show that she co-created with uh, uh, another woman named Anna Conkle. It's called Pen15, P-E-N-1-5. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we're, we're very proud of both of them. Yeah. Uh, Maya just, uh, just had a, a baby boy, so now I'm a grandfather. And so life is good. Uh, my wife and I will be celebrating our 
uh, 34th wedding anniversary next month. Congratulations. Thank you. Anyway, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Folks, uh, PeterErskine.com, if you ever want to send me a message, uh, there's Definitely. a one of those little uh, you know things you click on and 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 those mail those, those mails those yeah. emails uh, <laughs> come directly to me anyway thank you so much i wanted to um just ask you if possible to say this little phrase for us it's uh, the phrase goes hi i'm peter erskine and you're watching in the pocket with the brothers okay you ready okay this is going to be fancy you ready for this check this out Hi, I'm Peter Erskine, and you are watching In the Pocket with the Brothers. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you like that? Fantastic. <laughs> okay, okay, man. Um, Fantastic. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I love you, Thanks man. Thanks very much. I'm a huge fan. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, man. Obrigado. All the best. Bye. <laughs> Hey guys, if you want to see more content like this, don't. <laughs> Hi guys, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. So, um, yeah, do <laughs> Hey guys, if you. <laughs> subscribe to this channel, okay? <laughs>